I'm Emily Erickson, and I'm here not so much because of what I do at the state right now, which is mostly child protection work, but because of what I did prior to when I was at the state, which was a lot of work with um, families who were experiencing relational distress um, and trauma related to child abuse and neglect. And so um, that's what I'll draw on mostly as I talk today. My presentation style is pretty informal, and I recognize that this is actually a pretty difficult um, subject not only to talk about, but to also train. And um, this, I'm told, is, represents a shift or a rewrite of a previous um, curriculum. And so what we've tried to do in this curriculum is really um, present not only um, the concerning parts of relationships, knowing that we have many, many community members um, because we'll talk some about prevalence later, but knowing that we have lots of community members who are in really unhealthy and even dangerous relationships um, with also balance it with what a healthy relationship looks like so that we meet multiple needs and so that it's a bit less overwhelming for the community members who you are presenting to. Um, but along that same line, I just want to say before we start that it will be important for you when you present to members to give everybody um, kind of the freedom to take breaks and leave if they need to because this, um, this material could trigger a number of people. It could just be too much for them to hear depending on where they're at in their relationship currently. And so it'll be important just to give permission for people to go ahead and get some fresh air, take lots of breaks. Um, and, and you're probably going to have to read your audience a bit more as you're presenting to make sure that um, people aren't becoming too overwhelmed, especially based, you might know more about your audience, but depending on where you work or who you're pre presenting to. Um, but if this is a curriculum that could, uh, that could absolutely be presented um, not all in one session, and this um, is certainly one where you can shorten up many of the slides if it just feels like we need to keep moving along here, okay? Things that are helpful during presentations like this, if you're training community members, is to have things on the table for people to keep their hands busy. Um, can really help people deal with the anxiety of the topic um, and kind of discharge their energy into something else. Um, so coloring books on the table or different fidgets, Play-Doh, um, Silly Putty, anything that, that people can kind of just play with um, and encourage people to do that. That often helps in these kinds of topics. So anyway, I'm not gonna read the script. That's what I was saying. I'm not gonna read the script um, because you guys can read, but I'm gonna um, touch on what I think are kind of the most important things to consider on each slide and to think about and give some pointers. Um, so given that, we're just gonna jump right to slide four. There you go. The learning objectives. So the point of this session is um, to talk about both healthy and unhealthy relationships. And um, we want people to be able to I define and identify aspects of those relationships. Um, we're gonna talk some about healthy communication and concrete problem solving skills. And then um, at the end, we talk about, well, what do you do now with all of this information? What if you know someone or you have a loved one who's in an unhealthy relationship? Um, what if you're in an unhealthy relationship? Um, and we'll do some talking about that so that people don't feel like they just got an information dump and then they don't know how to action on it. Okay, so um, we're defining healthy relationships on by three building blocks, A, B, C's of healthy relationships, awareness, balance, and communication. We think this provides a good uh, foundation to kind of, as we reference back to all of the different aspects that we're talking about, they all relate to one of these parts. So um, awareness and balance. So uh, we talk first about those. So awareness is really about having your own self-awareness and knowledge about yourself as well as awareness of your partner. And then balance is making sure that no one person has more control than the other. So balance is about a mutuality in a relationship. Um, I, the important part of this slide that I think is really helpful for people when they're trying to think about awareness and balance is this um, kind of three parts of understanding who we are. So there's the knowing who I am, knowing who you are, and then knowing who we are as a, as a couple. Or it doesn't necessarily have to be an intimate partner. Okay? So um, many relationships, it's difficult to maintain both the sense of I and the sense of 
we or the sense of me and the sense of we. And so I think that's something that um, people resonate with that kind of language when I've talked to people about this before, about kind of understanding that when we get into health, healthy relationships, healthy relationships will look like you can still be you and you can still have a we. So the you, the I, the me doesn't get lost. Okay. The next slide we talk, we give a brief overview about communication and we'll talk more about that later. So I'm just gonna move right on past that slide. Okay. So if a relationship has the ABCs, it will look like this wheel. And this is the wheel of equality. So in the center is equality or mutuality. And all of the pie pieces around it are different aspects of how equality looks in relationships. So equality is the center because most, that's how the relationship is mostly defined. In contrast, this is the wheel of power and control. And this is what unhealthy relationships are characterized by. So power and control is in the center of the wheel and all of the pie pieces around the outside are different aspects of what power and control looks like in different relationships. It'll be important to say here that um, we're human and so we don't always have these like 100% healthy relationships um, and that we can all see ourselves in both wheels probably or different parts of our relationship in both wheels. So it's not that we don't have parts of this, but the distinction that we're trying to draw in this conversation is that um, this wheel, well both wheels, but this wheel in particular helps us understand that um, what it looks like when things become so unbalanced between partners that then the relationship is harmful or even dangerous. So we all have our moments where we might you know, do something that's not healthy in a relationship or we might say something that's not very supportive or kind, but that doesn't mean that you fall 100% into this power and control wheel. So the way that we decided to do this, uh, this presentation is to basically put these two wheels side by side and just walk our way through every pie piece and think about the contrasts between these two wheels and provide some different examples. And then we have some rabbit trails that kind of go off on other things. So the first part you can see is the wheel of power control has intimidation and the wheel of equality has non-threatening behavior. That's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm gonna move along so that we have some time with some of the other things. The next pie piece is um, emotional abuse versus respect and communication. Um, so something to just be aware of on this slide, we didn't change um, the word abuse on these wheels because these are established kind of wheels of power and control and equality, but abuse can often be a trigger word for people. So just so you know, we decided to keep it in, but um, one way to quantify this for people is that people are experiencing um, emotional abuse, things like name calling, mind games, humiliation, or making a partner feel excessively guilty. Um, people who are on that receiving end will often say that they just feel like they're crazy. You know, like they don't know which way is up, the, the rules are always changing, um, the blame is always with them, and so that is how people will often verbalize how it feels to be in this part of the wheel, is that they just feel crazy. Okay, in contrast, respectful partners um, are non-judgmental, they're emotionally affirming in their understanding, and they value a partner's opinions and viewpoints. So that goes back to the sense of me and we, right? They understand their partner to be a separate person from themselves. All right, so here we decided to then have some conversation about communication. Um, because you see at the, the previous slide, we kind of tie it in by saying respectful communication is important for healthy relationships. So here we go into communication. Okay, so this slide can be a lot of information for people. And so here's a slide where you're gonna wanna try and pare it down depending on who you're presenting to. But here's the main gist of the slide. Clear and direct communication is where you're probably gonna get your message heard the best. 
Then there's these other kinds of communication, masked indirect, masked indirect, and clear indirect. And I'll give some examples of these. But um, there's a cultural aspect to this slide that we need to be careful about because some people culturally just do not communicate in a clear or direct manner. And so we want to be careful that we don't um, give the perception that clear and direct is the only non-abusive way to communicate with people. So these other ways may not be as effective in the mainstream culture. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're like wrong or hurtful or harmful. So um, the big building blocks of, of these is that a clear message is um, like it's not veiled or muddied or masked. It's clearly stated. And a direct message is stated to the person or the receiver it's intended for. Okay. So let's just go through some examples. Um, masked and indirect. So let's imagine that you're a mom and um, you're really tired of your teenage kids not helping with the chores. I can't imagine anybody here identifies with that. <laughs> so let's just say that we're true in your home. And as a mom, if you were going to use the masked and indirect form of communicating, you would probably say to your friends at some time where your kids were not present, um, gosh, how hard is it to do chores after school? It's just, how hard is it? And then you might say, well, kids are just so dang lazy these days. Now, that's a mask. You might be venting. That's helpful. But um, it's masked because it's not really clear about like what I want is for my kids to please do the chores after school. It's kind of masked in this question of like, how hard could it be? And then it's indirect because the person who it's meant for isn't even there. So an example of a direct but masked communication would be the mom making a statement like that directly to her kids. So something like, um, kids these days just aren't interested in doing chores, or something like that. So it's to the son, so it's direct, but it's not actually stating what the outcome, the desired outcome is from the person making the statement. So um, a lot of our communication is this way because we just hope people kind of take a hint from our little messages that we drop around. But we know that that can create a lot of misunderstanding. OK, clear but indirect. An example would be um, you're sitting at the dinner table and mom says, I really wish the chores would just get done. So um, that's clear because that's the ask like I want the chores to be done but it's a bit indirect because you're at a dinner table you're not talking directly to the to the person okay so it's just kind of like this random announcement and then the hope is maybe one of your kids will decipher that they should they should do more chores versus a specific ask okay and then finally clear and direct um, is something such as I'm disappointed you didn't take out the trash after school without me having to remind you again directly to one of the children with a clear statement about what the expectation is. So the point of this slide, that can be a lot for people to hold in their brain when you are training on this. And so it would be totally appropriate for you to kind of talk about clear and direct and how that's really helpful is saying what you mean, meaning what you say, saying it to the person instead of kind of creating like gossip and different um, ways where you're hoping the message might get passed along or um, you're hoping someone will take a hint and provide an example of clear and direct and then talk through some other common things that we might say because we're all people who do all of these kinds of communications. So provide some additional examples of things that aren't clear and direct without telling them what I just did, which was here's an example of each one because that can be a lot for people to hold in their heads. So that's one way that you could alter this slide to make it a little less um, complicated if you're training on it. So there's a couple other pieces about effective communication that are important to mention right now. So we talked about being clear and direct, frequent communication, um, being an active listener. There's, that's defined, and I'm not going to go through it, but that's kind of defined in your notes what all of these ones are. 
remembering that everybody has a different communication style. So part of being in a healthy relationship is trying to understand how a partner communicates. Um, paying close attention to body language. I think that there's a really, um, there's, it's on the bottom of page 13, and there's a really, there's some really good verbiage I think is helpful to, to share. So when someone says like, um, if, some questions people are gonna have is you, is, for, of you is like, okay, fine, I'll communicate clear and direct, but my partner does not communicate like that. So how do I kind of interact with them in such a way that pushes them to have more clear, direct conversation with me, and how do I respond to the communication that's not as helpful? So I think there's a great, um, example on the bottom of page 13, which is um, kind of talking about, let's say someone is just kind of like, hey, are you doing okay? And then it's your, you know, I do this all the time. Yeah, I'm fine. Just like, leave me alone. You know, and then it's like, but then you're kind of hoping like someone's gonna be like, so are you really fine? Um, uh, so a great, I love this, is, is to kind of, the response to be, I, I respect what you're saying. Your body language tells me you're stressed. Um, when you're ready to talk, let me know and we'll work it out together. I feel like that still puts things in their court, right? So it's like when you're ready versus I'm not gonna do this prying, prying, are you sure, are you sure? Can you tell, are you sure? Um, you can tell I've never been in conversations like that. <laughs> um, but it sets the expectation that like, I'm ready to have this conversation. I'm reading your body language. I'm telling you I'm reading your body language and I'm here when it's time. So that's a nice example to give people, like it's helpful to give people actual words that they can use in strange or awkward situations. Okay, and then um, be positive. So back to the wheel of um, the healthy versus unhealthy relationships, the wheel of equality versus the wheel of power and control. The next piece of the pie is isolation versus trust and support. So often people who are in unhealthy relationships become increasingly isolated, more and more and more isolated. So. Um, the partner begins to limit access to friends, either by saying, I don't really trust your friends, I think you don't make good decisions with them, with family, the family hates me, you really shouldn't talk to them anymore, um, to starting to really uh, control a partner's comings and goings um, as a way to isolate. It's often couched in um, jealousy or just, I really love you so much, I wanna spend all my time with you. Okay, so it's put in that confusing language of love versus a relationship characterized mostly by equality, a healthy relationship, um, is trusting and supportive. So partners aren't necessarily regularly and all the time threatened by another partner's activities. Um, they're supportive of someone else's goals, their feelings, their friends, their important relationships, their activities. While they may have some concern about who a partner spends time with, that's addressed through a um, mutual conversation versus uh, a move to make a, a kind of a decision on behalf of a partner or limiting something specific. The next piece of the pie is minimizing, denying, and blaming occurs in unhealthy relationships, is an unhealthy healthy aspect of an unhealthy relationship versus in the wheel of equality we see honesty and, and accountability. So the big takeaway from here is that uh, relationships that are characterized mostly by power and control, one partner often um, sees most of the problems in the relationship as the other partner's issue. So um, responsibility is often shifted to the partner who has less power. Um, if there's any kind of abusive or hurtful behaviors that is couched in a conversation about how the other person could have pre prevented or not provoked those behaviors to happen. So lack of responsibility for their own actions. And I wanna say here, you can judge your, your um, audience on this, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that many of these boundaries get pushed um, sexually before they get pushed physically. And so um, lots of this happens, at least in my work experience with the many, many women and families I worked with, 
Uh, once I got enough trust and understanding with women, it was it's clear that a lot of these um, boundaries get pushed sexually, and it's and it's described as an accident. Okay, so you might have women that you're working with, and just be aware that they've probably experienced a fair amount of unwelcome sexual interactions that they may have tried to voice as unwelcome, but the partner um, describes it as, oh, sorry, it won't happen again. I'm sorry, it was an accident. I didn't know, or it just sometimes it just happens. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but this is a lot of what women hear. And so um, I think in this conversation, it's important to acknowledge that because I think it's true to a lot of women's experiences. I think if we don't acknowledge it, there's this whole piece of what they're experiencing in a relationship that's never talked about in a training like this. Um, so just because an it's an accident does not mean it's okay. Okay, because what often happens is these accidents just they continue to compound and then suddenly the woman finally realizes um, that they're in a kind of in trouble in a relationship. Um, but it starts real early on with just little pushes past whatever it is that they're comfortable with. So um, an interesting, another interesting part about this section of the wheel is that um, people who don't hold the power and control in the relationship are tricked into thinking they do. So if, I'm just gonna say men and women here just for ease of conversation right now. So if a man hurts a woman, um, leaves marks, that physically hurts her, and then the conversation later is, you know, uh, honey, if you just wouldn't have blank, blank, and blank, I wouldn't have overreacted and my anger wouldn't have been triggered and then none of this would have happened. The victim starts to think that, well, if I can anticipate my, my partner's every action, if I can read what happens when that person comes in the house, if I can make sure everything's in the specific order, if I can, I can, I can, I won't get hurt again my kids won't get hurt again, or this won't happen again. Um, and so um, it's an interesting um, shift for people who are in that relationship to kind of understand that, in fact, they don't have any control over their partner. But this is where victims have a hard time understanding that they are, in fact, in a relationship that is harmful to them because they think they just, that if they just did something a different way, it wouldn't really be a problem. Okay. And then healthy relationships are um, characterized by honesty and accountability, meaning that partners um, are able to take responsibility for their own actions. They can hear tough feedback. They can think through the consequences of, of their actions on someone else. The next section, responsible family care, is in the wheel of equality, and using loved ones is in the wheel of power and control. This one's kind of an obvious one, but um, one powerful form of manipulation is to use children or other people that you care a lot about, pets as well, and uh, to use threats to those individuals or those loved animals as ways to control behavior. Responsible family care um, means sharing parental responsibilities, being in a positive nonviolent role model for children, and when children aren't involved, pets. Something to note in this section that I think is really helpful for people is that outsiders feel safe when they witness conflict in the uh, wheel of equality and they don't feel the need to interfere to keep someone safe. You might feel uncomfortable when they witness conflict. None of us love to watch somebody else's conflict, but um, um, often people who are in an unhealthy relationship um, or who have loved ones in an unhealthy relationship, a sign would be they really worry when they're somewhere and there's conflict. They really wonder about what's gonna happen next. All right, the next section, shared responsibility versus abusing authority. This often looks like male privilege, but it does not have to. So this mostly looks at who's making the big decisions, who gets an input into the big decisions, um, is there one quote kind of master of the castle? And I don't mean that in like, 
one partner really knows what's going on with the kids most of the time. They're like the kind of default parent and the other partner is in charge of other things. That's a totally healthy, normal relationship structure. I'm not, like we're not looking to try and tell people how egalitarian their relationships need to be when it comes to traditional uh, gendered roles. But um, we are looking to try to articulate that there's a mutuality among distribution of work and that there's a willingness to pitch in um, to problem solve and to think through how um, there's shared partnership in the big parts of a relationship. Moves, jobs, childcare, um, chores. Okay, this one I'm not gonna talk too much about because it's about economic control, um, but often people who are in a relationship characterized by power and control have very little access to resources no matter how much resources that whole family has. Um, so the resources are very controlled. They are um, not easily accessed. They're closely monitored for one partner, but not for another. Um, many people in relationships like this actually have um, no access to resources. The resources are entirely controlled by one person. So um, one key sign here would be if someone tells you they kind of feel trapped in a relationship because of the money. Like, well, what am I going to do? I, like, I don't, I don't, if I left, what, what would I do? I don't have any money. I don't, I haven't seen people in years. I don't have any kind of, you know, they may feel like they don't have any skills because they've been out of, out of touch with anyone for a very long time. Okay, and then this last part is mostly the part we think about when we think about um, unhealthy relationships, coercion and threats versus negotiation and fairness. Um, and that's why we did it last, because what we're trying to kind of point out is that um, unhealthy relationships look lots of different ways, and they include lots of different things. And so you don't just have to have somebody who is kind of doing your stereotypical abuse such as um, hitting, kicking, um, lots of coercion. But things in this category include like um, threatening to commit suicide if someone leaves, um, you know, threatening to make a report to child welfare, or CPS, as, in, as a way to control a partner, um, even making a partner do illegal things or things um, that then can be used as blackmail. This represents um, a clear, all of these represent a clear imbalance of power and control in a relationship. So we're back to that B, the three building blocks of balance. That there's a clear imbalance in the power and control wheel. In equality, things are in balance. Um, and part of this means that if you're going to keep things balanced and you're going to keep things mutual, then you need to have a good way to resolve conflict. Right, because a lot of the other stuff that happens over here is around conflict. It's just one people, one person decides how the conflict gets resolved in the power and control, and equality two people decide how the conflict gets resolved. Okay, so that in, it, that involves negotiation and fairness, and so that's what mo it moves into here. That's our segue to conflict resolution. It's important to note when you're presenting on this, that these conflict resolution strategies really only work in balanced relationships, generally balanced relationships. Again, we're not going for perfection here. But a lot of these statements, a lot of these tools don't work when you're already deep inside a relationship of power and control. You don't necessarily have to say that, but it's something to keep in mind when you're gauging your audience. So we thought it would be important to provide some like, hey, here's some red flags that you might want, you might want to think more about if you're wondering about the relationship you're in or the relationship a loved one is in. Oftentimes, uh, people who are in unhealthy relationships, one of the most dominant partner often moves very fast. They want to get into a relationship quickly and often seem too good to be true. So it's so tricky, right? So it's important to encourage people to go slow, make sure they really understand who a person is, don't move too quickly. Because these are people who are like, man, they're like perfect. And they're perfect for like maybe 
three weeks. <laughs> they have a history of not taking responsibility for their behavior. So that would be like, you know, just in normal conversation with someone, you would hear a lot of talk about how the, lots of their past, let's say you're hearing about some of their past, is because of someone else, something, something, something. Um, they don't leave their partner alone, so they kind of like suction on right away, and suddenly you find that the person you're friends with is never alone anymore. Um, and a, intense irrational jealousy is another red flag. And a lot of that is not um, labeled jealousy, it's called love. So I just love you so much, I just don't ever wanna be away from you, and you know, I'm, I am sure um, you're such an attractive person that all of, um, let's just, we'll do men and women again because it's easier for the conversation. All the guys out there really want you. And so I just want to make sure that no one tries to trick you into having an affair. And so you just need to stay right here because I just love you so much and you are so attractive. Here's red flags for the partner. Is the partner reluctant to speak in front of their, the most dominant partner? Um, do they look to their partner before answering a question or look for that answer to come from the partner instead of themselves? Are they different in their partner? So um, they seem, they can seem more at ease or more anxious when the partner's around both. Um, but if this is someone you knew beforehand, so let's say we're talking to people who are like, you know, grandma's there and in your training and the grandma's worried about her granddaughter, let's say. Um, they might be, they might see flags such as my granddaughter's like a completely different person than I remember her being prior to this relationship. And does the person need to really make a lot of ex excuses for the partner's behavior, right? So those could be red flags that someone's in a dangerous or even abusive be uh, relationship. This I think is one of the more important slides that we have in here, honestly, because I think, um, it helps people put into context just what happens in relationships dominated by power and control. We decided to use the word domestic violence. Um, it's also called intimate partner violence or relationship violence. The misleading part about violence is it suggests that someone needs to be physically hurt. Um, but that is not at all true. So you can have a lot of emotional uh, coercion and power without someone ever getting actually hurt in real life like lots of threats without it actually ever happening so domestic violence is intentional um, people um, who are engaging in domestic violence make deliberate decisions about how to control their partner it's not just a mistake it's not just just the way I am there's an intentionality about it um, those uh, those intentions are typically directed at one person and there's efforts to hide what's really going on. So there's a lot of pressure on the partner not to tell people about, um, often you'll hear them say, just this, our business is our business. We don't tell other people about our business. That's a good, that's a good boundary sometimes, but sometimes it can be overused. Um, they use power and control tactics. We just talked about that by one intimate partner over the other in order to create an environment of fear and intimidation. So domestic violence is a cycle. It's an ongoing pattern, and it's rarely ever a one-time incident. So meaning, meaning it doesn't happen just once and that's like the last time. You know, so there's often um, promises that it won't happen again, but what we know about domestic violence is that's not the way it works. So that's why we have the cycle up here, and this is really important. So you start in the honeymoon period. This is when things are really good. Like, this is too good to be true. This relationship is awesome. I'm constantly getting flowers and chocolates and calls and texts, and I feel more loved than I've ever felt. Tension starts building because someone can't possibly maintain that level. Tension starts building. And then there's some kind of explosive incident. During the tension building time, victims often say they feel like they're walking on eggshells. They know it's coming, like things are getting more tense, there's more focus on them, they're feeling like my, my partner is becoming more agitated on a regular basis. Um, and then there's some kind of explosion. It doesn't have to be like 
I punched you in the face kind of explosion. It can be physical or sexual as well as verbal, as well as just a whole lot of threats to someone's safety. That's all we need often to control someone. Um, and then the honeymoon period starts all over again. So then there's kind of this, um, things just calm way down. There's lots of apologies. Um, there might be a lot of um, even like deep personal reflection from someone, promises that it won't happen again. I never really meant it. I was drunk, I was high. Um, and um, rarely, rarely, rarely um, is that the end of a domestic violence relationship. So you're in the honeymoon period and then tension builds and then an explosive incident. And this can happen over days, weeks, months. So honeymoon periods can last for a really long time, actually. And this is why it's so hard to leave. Because um, often the partner who has less control really loves that honeymoon period. It feels really good. And so does the partner who has control, honestly. I mean, that's like a really fun time in a relationship. Um, and so, um, sometimes people will say their partner seems totally different in this honeymoon period. Like it's like a whole different person once again than when the explosive incident happened. And so people often feel like the real partner, the person they know, the person they love is the one who shows up at the honeymoon period. Rate of recidivism is really high. And I think that's because um, Right now, the prevalent form of treatment is anger management. And what we know from research is this isn't about anger management. This is about a sense of entitlement. It's a sense of they get a real tr kind of trip off of power. So um, the techniques that are needed are, are more around empathy building, respect building for other people. So there's a real kind of self-focus in people who engage in power and control, um, there's a lack of empathy for others, there's a real sense of entitlement, it's not about anger. Um, although certainly some people with anger management issues will also hurt people with their actions, physically even. Um, but what we know about domestic violence and this cycle in particular is that we're not treating it right and that's why the recidivism is so high. <laughs> All right, prevalence. So. Uh, one in four women in the U.S. will experience uh, relationship abuse in her lifetime. One in seven men in the U.S. will experience it in his lifetime. So it's important, I think, although this is a really hard topic to address and a really hard presentation to give and often feels very uncomfortable for people, um, this is, domestic violence is more prevalent among women than diabetes, cervical cancer, and or breast cancer. And we put a lot of energy into talking to women about those other um, health issues. And so I would say we should put the same amount of effort in talking and educating about healthy relationships and relationship red flags. Okay, so here's the now what part. So there's a risk in giving this presentation, right? Because you are likely gonna have someone come up to you and give a disclosure or um, someone's gonna be sitting in the audience and they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that is my daughter. I didn't know there was a word for it. What do I do now? And so this is, it's like cracking, it's like, you know, you just start cracking the book and then there's all these other questions that come up. So keep in mind, this is about just education so that, and awareness, right? So we're trying to get education and awareness. But this next section is about, okay, now what do you do one, if someone confides in you, and you'll give this information to the people you're presenting to, but this is also really for you guys, so I'll talk to you guys some during this time as well. Okay, most importantly to remember is that um, um, people in relationships characterized by power and control, the person who does not typically hold power has a lot of allegiance and alliance with the person who does, because that's how they make it. That's the only way that they can navigate these relationships. They become super good at reading the situation. They can tell uh, the minute someone walks in the room whether or not there's gonna be an explosive incident or not. 
they become really good at reading their environment and they become very aligned and um, invested in the story that that person is telling them. So they become very invested in it being their fault all the time. They become very invested in defending their partner. Um, often when other people get involved, such as police, that becomes an external threat on the family. It's seen as something um, by the person who doesn't have power and control to be something they also can't control. So that's then also seen as a mutual threat to the relationship. That's often why um, women uh, just really don't like it when, when people get involved uh, because they don't, they are at least in a situation where they know what to expect and they spend a lot of time controlling how that goes, they think. And then when you insert another third party, that also inserts a wild card that that woman doesn't know what to expect about. So it's important to keep that in mind that um, help and intervention really needs to occur, although it's hard to accept, needs to occur on the um, victim's timeline and when they're ready. Because otherwise, it is like pushed away, pushed away, pushed away because it's a threat. It's not a help from their perspective. Now, of course, if we're talking about children being at significant safety risk, you guys are all mandated reporters, so that would be a required thing that you need to report. You, don't ha you do not have to report just the existence of domestic violence, but if you were to have some kind of indication that the children are being harmed in that situation and hurt, then that's something where you don't, we don't, we kind of don't wait for that woman to be ready. Okay? Okay. You want to share your concern, so use I statements. You can read here, I'm not gonna go through it all. Um, it'll be important to listen without judgment, so trying very hard not to use blaming language toward the abuser. Because again, there's alignment there. Um, sharing resources, you have handouts. Setting good examples, so um, providing lots of opportunities for them to observe and witness a different way to do a relationship. And making sure, um, so often if you're in a position where you have a loved one, that you are often gonna be used as someone to um, the partner will be speaking poorly about you, so it's important that anytime you have contact, you are providing unconditional love and respect to whoever it is that you're in a relationship with, your loved one. Okay, so when someone confides in you, it's again, all of this, I'm not gonna read it, but all of this is based on making sure that the power in that disclosure stays with the woman, so, or the, or the person experiencing the being controlled. So they drive, they decide, you're constantly offering help and support, but you're walking with them, but you're not forcing them to talk to somebody. Um, you're not making decisions for them. Um, you're redirecting the conversation to safety. That's a concrete thing you can talk about. And you are um, validating just how brave and courageous they are in the relationship because indeed they are, and they are surviving something every single day that takes a whole lot of skill to navigate. Validating that it's not indeed their fault. Okay, so these last parts um, talk about um, self-care, and it's just a reminder to people, and it's a reminder to us that we really can't control anyone and it's important for us to kind of reconcile that inside of ourselves. And um, while someone may be controlled by a partner who we see as abusive, we don't help the situation if we come in and control in some different way. Because it just continues to take power away from the person who is already not empowered. So that means we need to be really comfortable that only we can control what we do. We need to be comfortable with the fact that people might make different choices than what we would like them to make and stay kind of grounded in that I will just continue to offer unconditional love and respect. I will continue to engage in a relationship with this person. I will continue to offer resources. But I know that it's up to them. And that is perhaps the hardest part about this and where you'll probably feel the most um, uneasy in 
you just got a disclosure, you provided resources, you offered assistance, and then it kind of feels like, and then I just walked away. You know, like I went home. And I don't feel like I really did something. And that can be really hard inside ourselves. Okay, and then self-care, you're gonna be hearing about self-care from the mental health presentation, so I'll leave that. The question is about children in homes that have domestic violence and do women ever choose to leave um, to help their children be in a more healthy environment and also acknowledging that children often know when something isn't right and they're very scared when they are living in these homes. I think it goes both ways for mo what motivates people to leave. Um, I think if um, it can be helpful to reflect with women upon like what's it like for your kids because often people feel like well he never actually hits my kids or he doesn't ever so um, to reflect on what's it like for your child to see you hurt like that what's it like for them to hear you call those what do you think they feel like when that's happening that can be helpful so long as um, we don't use children as a guilt factor because those kids are already being used as a guilt factor likely um, and I would say 50-50, women stay because they think leaving will be more dangerous for their kids, um, or they leave because they think staying will be more dangerous. I, it really depends on how, it, it just really depends on how they, they interpret the situation they're in. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, thank you very much.